Where'd you grow up? I grew up in the metropolis of Tuscaloosa, Alabama. And what kind of music did you listen to when you were growing up? Lots of rhythm and blues. Uh, Otis Redding, Wilson Pickett, uh, Rita Franklin. But then, of course, I was around when the British, uh, the first wave of the British invasion happened, and so I was definitely influenced by the Beatles and the Rolling Stones and uh, a few of those guys, zombies, you know, that kind of thing. We used to play fraternity parties, you see. That was, uh, that was how I got into music. I started out playing guitar <clears throat> when I was about 13. We used to play YMCA parties on Friday nights. And uh, eventually the guitar players in town started uh, out uh, outdoing me, so I had had a little experience with the piano. My mother played piano and I used to imitate her. And I, I sort of got an ear for it, so I switched over to keyboards. And man, we used to play every fraternity on, uh, on the fraternity row there in Tuscaloosa, you know. And that, that, that was uh, big money and lots of fun, you know all the beer you could drink. I was playing at its very best. Yes, what, indeed. Um, what, what was the name of your first band? The Misfits. <laughs> With a Z. <laughs> what kind of music did you guys play? Oh, we covered uh, pretty much everything I, I just said. The Beatles uh, and uh, lots of R&B, though. We, we were heavily influenced. You know, Temptations, Four Tops. Uh, that was real big back then. Of course, Muscle Shoals uh, was in full swing back in those days, and there was a lot of records being done up there. And rhythm and blues was a heavy, heavy influence in the South in, in those days. That was I'm talking like '64, '65. Now, being from the South, and we're talking about your influences. I noticed that you didn't mention any sort of a country influence. Did it have none on you at that point? Well, it was there, but I grew up in suburbia and went to, uh, you know, a high school in the middle of town and everything. It wasn't like I was in a real rural situation. So, as I was growing up, the kind of music that was around me was uh, mostly what was on the contemporary radio stations and, and not, not the country stations. It wasn't until later that I began to appreciate it. Really, when Ray Charles uh, came out with his country records, that's that's when I got hip to it and I uh, sort of saw country music in a different light. And then later, when I heard Floyd Kramer for the first time, uh, I was really impressed with him, and, and uh, he, was, he was one of the main influences on me. It was just a second ago, you were, uh, you were singing some Johnny Cash for us. Is Johnny, uh, <laughs> you a fan of his? Oh, yeah. Uh, my sister used to be an usher, at the Johnny Cash show, if you remember back in the 70s, early 70s, he had a television show. And uh, she used to get me in free. I went to a couple of shows and I really enjoyed that. But, uh, Kenny Aronson is really the Johnny Cash authority in this band. I have to pass the hat to him when you talk about Johnny. Yes, he's just, he just uh, gave us an earful about Johnny <laughs> just a little while ago. So, let's see. You're 13 years old or so, you're in a band called the Misfits. What you know, after that? Well, we had our own little TV show, The Misfits. We had, as I mentioned, the uh, YMCA on Friday night. We had a show called Tuscaloosa Bandstand, fashioned after American Bandstand on Saturday mornings. And, you know, it was the same kind of thing. We'd have all the, the kids from school come and, and dance, and uh, we'd do the music. And they used to put these funny little signs in front of the guys in the band, you know, like one of the guitar players' name was Ronnie. They'd put gut plucking Ronnie up there. <laughs> They had all these silly little things, but it was, you know, we thought we were hot stuff back then. Hey, man, I had our own TV show, had the YMCA locked in on Friday night. What more could you ask for? You know? And then, as I mentioned later, uh, when we got a little bit more serious about music and started experimenting with arrangements and, and the action, and the novelty wore off. The music began to get a little bit more serious. Uh, uh, we started doing a little bit of writing and. and but we had a lot of fun with arrangements. We used to take Beatles songs or, or Stone songs or anything we could uh, figure and, and just totally turn them around, do them completely backwards. You know, we used to have a version of uh, Let's Spend the Night Together. It was just a real slow, sexy uh, arrangement. But that's, that's where it really started to become interesting to me because we were doing these arrangements. We weren't doing it just like it was on the record, you know, and it became 
uh, a challenge, you know. Did you, um, do you think you always knew you wanted to be a musician? Since I was very young, that's the only thing that really excited me, you know. When I was 13 and, and just learning how to play guitar and playing uh, just for the friends and parties and stuff, it was just such a thrill. I mean, what can you say? You know, everybody's watching you, and you got the you got the spotlight a little bit. And, uh, you up there shaking the thing and having a good time. People getting off, and uh, you know, I said, hey, this, this ain't too bad. You know, I think I could do this for a while. You know, and people say, oh, it's going to be a, a passing thing. You're going to grow out of it. But I never did. What about, uh, how did this whole, what was going on in the 60s with, uh, and with the, uh, sort of the, the folk movement with Dylan and Baez and those sort of people, what sort of effect did that have on you? Hold on. Slow down a little bit, we'll get a little less. Okay. I'll do 85 instead of 90. So. Mm. Hey, we still working? Uh, 659. Yeah, we're still uh, working on this trip. Oh, it's so pretty. And it's, uh, this is my favorite time of day. It's not so wonderful. You can buy it, I think. talking to about the whole the whole folk movement and, and Dylan and Baez and those sort of people. Did it have any effect on you? Well, actually the first folk mu music <laughs> that influenced me was the Kingston Trio. That's how I learned how to play guitar. My cousin uh, had a, an old, I think it was a Stella guitar, and he used to know a couple of Peter, Paul and Mary songs and a couple of Kingston Trio songs, uh, Greenback Dollar, you know, that kind of thing. And so he showed me E, D, and A on the guitar, and, uh, and that, that was the end of it, man. That's all I needed to know. I was gone after that. But uh, the Kingston Trio, as I say, and Chad and Jeremy and some of those old uh, folk uh, groups and, and duets and whatever, uh, it did influence me. Dylan, not so much at that time. I was pretty young when he was coming around. It wasn't until later in the 60s that I began to understand what he was all about. And, and then, of course, once I did, he influenced me along with the rest of the world. Well, Dylan seems to be a good place to to, uh, to ask this next question when talking about him. Um, <coughs> certainly, with, with, and he is a primary example of it. Music having the ability to change things and change people. Do you think that's true? Without a doubt, I think it's probably the largest uh, influence I could think of on people's lives because it touches everybody, doesn't it? It's just not like it just touches <clears throat> uh, one sector of people. I mean, everybody loves music, whether it be uh, contemporary music, folk music, classical music, rock music, jazz. Uh, everybody loves music and, and, of course, especially in that era, in the 60s and 70s, uh, lyrically, politically, music was making a lot of statements and there's there's absolutely no doubt about it. I think you can see the changes today. Um, it seems like what was happening with, with, with a guy like Dylan in the 60s, there was one guy playing coffee houses and playing guitar and making uh, making a change and saying things. And it seems like we've come a long way to what we've seen happen in 1986 with Live Aid and Farm Aid. What, what do you think it was about 1986 as a year that that caused musicians to wake up again? You know, that's, that's hard to say. In my opinion, you know, when uh, when they did Live Aid, and gosh, I forget the fellow's name now. Who's Bob Geldorf. Bob Geldorf, excuse me, Bob. Never met him before, so maybe I've got an excuse. But uh, when Geldorf got that together, I mean, of course, it was a great, great cause. Uh, anytime you see pictures of starving children with their bellies, swollen from malnutrition and the like. I mean, it's going to strike a chord. and uh, It's hard to say exactly what it was that, that got musicians into it, other than to say Geldorf uh, was certainly influential and, and must have carried some weight because he convinced a lot of people to get involved. 
I think it was a great thing, you know, and I think it was also a great thing for Farm Aid. That strikes uh, a chord with me because I own a farm, and uh, the people around me, I don't grow crop, I have a tree farm, but the people around me uh, that do row crop, I mean, I see, I see it all the time. Right before I left home to come on the road, there was an auction. The guy went out, you know, right up the road from me, less than a mile away. You see it in the movies, but when it happens right next door, it makes you think. Is that coming from the mirror? Might be yeah, off the mirror. Uh, yeah. Is there something I can put there to shade it? Nice, so you can just stick a magazine Yeah, just to... Sorry for the uh, turbulence. Fasten your seat belts. No smoking. Chuck, it seemed like one of the... Are you ready, Bob? <coughs> Robert, I'm just chatting away. Yeah, one of the things that Farmate did, um, other than, you know, certainly make a lot of people aware of the plight of the American farmer and what he's going through right now, I think it made us, some of us realize how little difference there is between country and rock and roll music. What do you think? Well, certainly country has influenced rock and roll music in a big way. I'd venture to say that country was perhaps around a little bit before rock and roll was, you know. Uh, I think it was a natural thing for them to mingle. I mean, look, you know, Elvis Presley is a perfect, perfect example. Excuse me, I got a Check my rearview mirror here. Okay. Uh, and of course, having grown up in the South, and you asked me about country music influence uh, down there when I was growing up, and there was no way you could get around it. You know, it was definitely going to influence you. Yeah, I think country music and the blues uh, and black music sort of merged together and uh, helped form rock and roll, a la Chuck Berry, Bo Diddley, etc., etc. I agree. Now, you played in certainly what we can consider one of the great American rock and roll bands. I mean, that, that's a statement that can be made. I can't imagine that anyone who made it. How did it come together? Well, I was working with Alex Taylor, James Taylor's elder brother. Still sings better than James as far as I'm concerned. Uh, and we were both on the same record label, that is Alex Taylor and the Allman Brothers Band. And we opened up a lot of shows uh, for the brothers. And after we'd do our set, I used to always use a real piano, one of the, one of the few keyboard players that uh, held tight to that rule. And when our set was over, we'd pull the piano backstage and I would always hang around while the brothers were playing and I'd sit down and I'd play backstage uh, all the songs that the brothers did. I just love their music, man, you know. I, also, I should back up a little bit. There's a guy, Paul Hornsby, if you don't know who Paul Hornsby was, uh, he's best known for producing a lot of Marshall Tucker Band records. But Paul came from Alabama as well and he used to play with Greg and Dwayne and the Hourglass. And I had known Paul, so I, you know, through him, I knew the guys a little bit and also through opening the shows. But having done this backstage with the piano, I learned the feel for the music and I was influenced by that. And later on, I worked with Dr. John and we did the same thing, opened up a lot of shows for the Almonds. Well, after Dwayne died, the band went out as a five-piece unit and we were still opening up uh, from time to time. When they came off that tour, they went back in the studio and they decided rather than try to do the next record with five pieces, they wanted some other uh, instrumentation to go along with it. And rather than to try to replace Dwayne Allman, which I think would probably be impossible, they chose uh, the keyboard. And I, I guess the guys remembered me. Johnny Sandlin, who produced that record, uh, called me up and said, you want to play? And I said, well, sure, John, why not? Now, I was elated. Uh, to get that position, and and then it, after working with the guys and doing the record for about a couple of months, they asked me to join the band permanently. I found a home. What um, that music and that band spoke to a certain type of audience, a certain segment of America. What do you think that was? 
Well, you know, it was never really said back in those days, but I think uh, similar to the way Bruce Springsteen is sort of the working man's uh, band or hero, if you will, musical hero at the present time, uh, I think the Allman Brothers was sort of the same way uh, for some reason. Also, don't forget, uh, we were just coming out of the psychedelic era, and uh, the Allman Brothers carried some of that influence over, but they, they married it with rhythm and blues and with uh, black-influenced music. And uh, I mean, you know, what can you say? Greg is, is one of the greatest uh, white male voices there is. And uh, I don't know, it just all sort of gelled together and made a really unique sound. That was one of the things that the Allman Brothers had. They didn't sound like anybody else. They sounded like the Allman Brothers band. Did, uh, do you think it was a uniquely Southern sound, or did it seem to... to uh... It was heavily Southern influence, you know, but, but uh, uh, Greg and Dwayne had lived out in California for a number of years and had uh, picked up some influence from out there, you know, so it wasn't all a southern sound, even though everybody called it southern rock, and I believe it did define what southern rock was, and it was certainly more influenced by the south than it was from their their time out in California, but uh, point being that that's part of what uh, made it all happen, you know, was putting together a lot of different influences. How, how would you, if you could, describe the music? The Almond Brothers. Yeah. Oh boy. Well, that's that's really hard to do, you know. And I think that's probably a good thing uh, because when you can't define something, when it's hard to find the right words, then you know that it's, it's something truly magic and truly uh, of its own. And I really think uh, I'd be hard pressed to say it's it's not R and B. It's not the blues. It's influenced by all of that, but. That's the beauty of it. It's only influenced by it. It's not copying anything else. Uh, it's one within its own. It really is. Just a second ago about... Somebody look in that mirror and see if I can get over it. Uh, yeah, okay. Thank you. Hold on, hold on. You stay on 70 East. What? I said, well done, well done. Stay on 70 oh, East. Okay. Yeah. Um, Well, today I'd have to mention uh, John Cooper Mellencamp. I think he's certainly in the mainstream of that. Uh, well, let's see. Now, those two guys really presently, I think Brian has a chance uh, to fit in there. You know, he really does. He's, uh, a lot of his songs reflect America. And, uh, you know, uh, stray cats aside, I think what he's doing now could certainly fit in there with, with what those guys are sort of all about, what they're representing, you know. I'm not saying, I'm not trying to compare him because he's certainly a lot different from, uh, from both those guys, but I would have to mention those at least. Uh, Bob Seeger may be in a different way, you know, but uh, I think Springsteen, what can you say, he's definitely, he's definitive American rock and roll right now. Kind of says it, I guess, without a doubt. And I agree with you, John Hoover also. I mean, it's really funny because we're in taking this ride today and in interviewing people and seeing stuff go past. All that goes through my mind is John Hoover's song, Little Pink Houses, yeah. Ain't That America. Yeah. Um, it just kind of says it. Let's talk a little bit more about, um, about Brian's music and playing with Brian. How would you, how would you describe his new sound? Well, I think what's important is that Brian uh, is a well-respected musician coming out of the Stray Cats. I mean, the Stray Cats were, uh, you know, of course, known for the rockabilly sound and everything. And what's really important now is that Brian has, has made a step forward, you know, in the music. It's, uh, he wrote some great rockabilly songs. I mean, he was the only—he's the only guy I could name you that was this, that was doing rockabilly that wasn't just covering other people's songs. I mean, he was writing new rockabilly hits, you know, great stuff. 
But, uh, I mean, let's face it, how long can, can you make a career out of that, you know? And I think it was such a wise thing and such a brave thing for him to do to step out of that and uh, make such a great attempt to, to write uh, music out of that genre uh, that fits in to today's music. And it, it's just good, honest music, you know? Brian's not a not pretending to be anybody. He's not out there being someone's idea of what an artist ought to be. Brian is, is one of the most sincere guys that I've been around in a long time. Uh, to describe the music, it's American rock and roll. Simple as that. Could, um... Can we, can you up the visor? Is the visor, oh. do you have to have that done? Uh, I don't know how, to, how these machines operate. There we go. That's good. Oh, yay. What? Uh, 257. Might have to help me on the right there. Okay, go for it. Uh, you're fine. I can get over? Yeah. All right, I'm going to go ahead and pull over. I don't know what's behind me. Here with all these driving by committee. Huh? Really? <laughs> yeah. Oh, it looks great. Of course, he's such a handsome guy. You know? It'd be hard for him not to look great. But that kills. But that kills me, Dean. It seems hey, like... But, but, uh, when you're doing it, it's okay. But once you leaned in when he was talking... Oh, I did? Yeah. I leaned towards him? Yeah. It's magnetic. He's magnetic. Oh. I can't help it, I'm telling you. Well, what if oh. I just lean? Ooh, you've been troubleshooting. Um, yeah, it's these big, hairy-legged bus drivers that get them off. Every time. <laughs> How many times, Chuck, do you think... You've traveled across America. Uh, you mean all the way around in one trip, or, or just, uh, to and from? To oh, and from. God. It'd be easier to, easier to ask me how many times a year I do it. You know? Okay. I mean, probably at least three times a year. Uh, in some fashion, I'm traveling from coast to coast. Uh, gosh, I don't know. I, I've been doing this for about 15 years, so. It's been a lot of times. I, I wouldn't make an attempt. Maybe 30 times or something. When you uh, when you're traveling like this, when you're on a tour and you're on a bus and you stop, like you stop several times today, do you talk to people? Yeah, sometimes uh, you know you make a truck stop or even at airports if you're flying, whatnot, and you always bump into people, uh, interesting people. Uh, you see a little bit of Americana. And, meet people from all walks of life. You know, it's interesting. Now, do you write at all? Oh, yeah. You do? I'm not a terribly prolific writer. I don't uh, turn out five tunes a week, you know, but uh, with Sea Level, I was a primary writer in that band. And as a matter of fact, uh, you may not know that I've co-written a song on the current Rolling Stones album. Whoa! No, I didn't know that. Yay! Tell me, tell me about it. Well, it's called Back to Zero. Uh, it's on the Dirty Work album, and it was uh, written by Mick and, and Keith and myself. Great. What's the tune like? Well, it's a bouncy little ditty, <laughs> uh, and uh, as the lyrics might imply, it's concerning nuclear proliferation and the idea that we should get back to zero, down to nothing. Are you a political animal? No, not really. I, uh, I try to, to keep those opinions to myself. Of course, I've got opinions like everybody else, but I'm not terribly vocal about them. Uh, we were talking earlier about America and farm aid and the plight of the farmer. Now, that, again, that's something that strikes close to home to me, and I do try to keep up politically with what legislation is going on concerning the farmer. It concerns me, and it certainly concerns the people that live around me. Mm -hmm. How did how did people that live around you react to farm aid? What was what, what did you hear from your neighbors? Oh, it was nothing but wonderful things. Uh, it was a great, great gesture, and uh, hats off to Bob Dylan for making that suggestion in Live Aid, and hats off to uh, Mellon Camp and Neil Young and uh, everybody that was involved with that project. It, I don't think it. Willie Nelson, I've got to mention, it was really his, uh, he was the head man in the, in the whole deal, but <clears throat> even though it may not have raised as, as big 
money that they wanted, you know, as much money as they were going for, it brought attention to the plight of the farmer, and that was, that's what it's all about. You just got to be aware of it. You know, people have to understand that these, these guys are out there working 12-hour days, 16-hour days, losing money, and largely because of programs that the government put into action back in the 70s, and it's just, it didn't work. And, and now they're faced with with deep, deep financial difficulties, and uh, these, these guys are America. It seems really funny to me that we, I mean, this is, this is a nation that was really founded by farmers and, and grew and developed because of farmers, and, and to have, for us to have allowed ourselves to have gotten that far away from it, it's really, it's real scary. Yeah, it is. It's real scary to me. I think we've talked about, in talking to people today, and, and talking about interviewing other people about this show, one of the things that I'm hearing a lot in, in thinking about American rock and roll is simplicity and, and good, clean music. Um, what do you think about that? Do you think that is American rock and roll? Well, you know the old saying, the beauty of simplicity. Uh, there's another saying that less is more. I think if you can... Uh, get down to the basics when it comes to rock and roll in terms of lyrics. Make your statement, make it up front, you know, you don't have to go around corners lyrically to to say what you want. And then same with the music, you, you don't have to, that's, that's what rock and roll is all about, you know, you don't have to go through 15 chord changes to get a point across. I mean, there's other styles of music where that works very effectively. I'm a jazz freak, I love jazz music, and I love the, the, the chord changes and the melodies and the harmonic and the harmonies and harmonics of jazz. Uh, uh, but when it comes down to rock and roll, it's basics, man. You know, and if you if you go too far overboard, a lot of times it doesn't work. Is rock and roll American, Chuck? Absolutely, absolutely. Rock and roll is true American music. Hey, look, when you work with guys like Keith Richards. Uh, and, and Mick Jagger and, and all the guys with the stones and you walk into their hotel room after the, the gig and they're playing Chuck Berry and they're playing Four Tops and they're playing Temptations and they're playing uh, Little Willie John and the Dominoes and Fats Domino. Hey, that's America, man. It's American music. The odd thing is that those guys know so much more about the details and the history of early American rock and roll than any American I could name it. And I think the reason for that is that they, uh, it wasn't readily available for them, was it? I mean, they heard it through German radio and occasionally through the BBC radio, I guess, but uh, uh, every one of them that I've talked to, Bill Wyman has told me this, you know, that hit hear a record on German radio and just go nuts and, and he would just remember every detail of the record and then later when it did become accessible for them to buy the records and to study them they did whereas the guys musicians uh, that were growing up here in America had such easy access to it I think to a large degree we tended to take it for, for granted. Sure, sure. But guys like the Stones and, and the British groups do you think it was important for them to not only read about the music but also to come to the places where it was born, you know, Memphis in particular? Oh, I'm sure that that had to be a big thrill uh, for them to be able to come and see the areas physically that, uh, that these guys grew up in that influenced their music. Yeah, I'm sure it did. You know, uh, with those guys, though, having been stars in their own right early on in the 60s, practically at the same time that Little Richard and, and Chuck Berry Bo Diddley were happening too. They were on the same tours together, right. you know. So they got to spend time with, the, with their idols. I mean, you know, I, I've overheard conversations about that several times. It's, it's a lot of fun to listen to them talk about it. Being a Southerner, maybe you can answer this question for me. I'm sorry, Robert. Excuse me. Um, why do you think? I mean, when you think about it, um, when you think of Elvis. <clears throat> and Little Richard, and Jerry Lee, and Fats Domino, the 
those people in particular who basically gave birth to rock and roll. They're all from the South. It all happened right Absolutely. there. Absolutely. You got it, darling. It's all up. <laughs> it's Put a big all... grin on my face when you said that. How come? Why do you, why, what, what, why there? Why, why was it in Memphis? Why was it in, in New Orleans? Why was it in, in you know? Well, it was in New Orleans, uh, fast domino. I mean, Memphis, why was it in Memphis and New Orleans in the South? Why was it in, you know? Well, it did later uh, transfer to other areas. I mean, Chicago had certain influences, Detroit, uh, Philadelphia, but early rock and roll, you're right. All the guys were from the South, Chuck Berry, Fast Domino, and all those, all those guys. The only answer I can give you, I don't think it's an easy answer, but I think because, largely because that's where the blues originated from, and I think a lot of that music grew out of blues influence, and I think, I think that's what it boils down to. Yeah, I think, yeah, I agree with you. That and just, I think maybe in the South, even white people had more access to black music. I mean, it was all that's very, more closely related. That's very true, but you know, that's that's where the whole idea of feeling, you know, the idea of soul in music came from. It was, it was from the blues era, uh, even, even down to in the 1800s during the slave days, to field hollers. You know, that's where blues came from. It was, it was pain, man, you know, serious pain. You're out there working 16 hours a day in a 90 degree field picking cotton, you're gonna feel some pain. And one of the ways to ease that pain is to sing a little bit. What do you sing about? You sing about your pain. That's where the blues comes from. And uh, it's such great music. It just, it just grabs you so, you know, way down deep uh, that it can't help but touch people that, that, that hear it. And the blues began to grow up as time went on. Uh, the, the player, the musicians got a little bit more sophisticated, you know, could play a few licks instead of just uh, bang a chord or something. Uh, and they would start singing about more, uh, a more diverse lyrics, you know, talk about their women pain that the women put them through. There's always pain, though, isn't it? And usually yeah. pain about women. Yeah. <laughs> Rolling. Okay, we're rolling and ready. Go ahead with questions. We're talking about blues and pain. Well, as we were saying, the blues really originated with field hollers uh, in the in the cotton fields when slaves were picking cotton, and then it sort of made its way into little uh, dive joints that. Uh, Know, guys would hang out after work and all, but it also transferred in to the churches and uh, gave birth to gospel music. Uh, again, very, very soulful, touching, uh, way, way down deep. Who's your favorite stuff. blues artist? Oh man, that'd be hard for us to to name one guy that's better than all the rest of them. I'll just have to name a bunch of them. You know, Little Willie John. One of the greatest singers ever, man. If you ever listen to those early records, uh, Leave My Kitten Alone, and Need Your Love So Bad, oh, it's great. Uh, Lightning Hopkins, Howlin' Wolf, uh, Muddy Waters. Uh, you know, I, I, I'd have to have a list in front of me. There's so many, many of them. You know. What about White Blues? Well, I tell you, I suppose that uh, that I'd have to say that Elvis Presley, you know, was one of the first what I would consider white blues performers, you know, in terms of a vocalist. And I think a lot of people, you know, when they think of Elvis, they think of this image of this huge, enormous star. But let's break it down to what he was all about to begin with, and that was his voice. Man, I cat had a, a, a velvet, velvet voice, you know, and he had the feeling uh, that people have when they sing the blues. And he was, of course, influenced heavily by country music, and that's what made it magic. You, know, you put the country and the blues in 
and that velvet voice together, and you had Elvis Presley. Do you know that his hair was red and he died of black? Pull one on me then. No, I didn't know that. It is true. The, the amazing fact, isn't it? His hair is red. His hair is red. He died of black. Yep. Isn't that amazing? Well, I knew he died at, in the old, I mean, in the uh, latter days. It was no. obvious, but I had no idea. It certainly early. was. He was a red hat, sort of a strawberry blonde red. Yeah. Wow. Indeed. Oh, I'm like myself. <laughs> you can amaze your family and friends with that That's fact. Great. Very few people know it. Um, only three minutes left on this tape. But we have more tape. Okay, so let's get into it. What am I looking for here? 70. Stay on 70 East, sir. 70 East, okay. So we're going to ask just one or two more totally devastatingly relevant questions here. So let's think. Yeah. What is it, Chuck, about your musicianship that makes you right for playing with Brian? Well, geez, uh, I think Brian respected my work with the Allman Brothers Band and with Sea Level. Uh, I don't know. I'm a field player. You know, I'm I'm not a great. Uh, I can't read music. I'm not a great technician. I did go through a period of time when when I tried to improve my technique and I gained a lot out of it. But really, I'm a soul player. You know, uh, so I think he wanted uh, feeling. He wanted somebody that could play with sincere feeling and and drive a bus. <laughs> Is that? Do you think that's one of the most important elements of rock and roll? Driving a bus, without a doubt. <laughs> you can't drive a bus, you don't belong. <laughs> Emotion and feeling. Oh, yeah, that's what it's all about. Look, you know, if you, if you want technique and if you want uh, uh, incredible melodies, then you should look to other types of music. You should look to jazz and to classical music. But if you want soul and you want feel, and, you know, look to rock and roll and the blues and the rhythm and blues. That's what it's all about. Could you ever live anywhere other than America? Not permanently, no. I, I, I would love to be able to, uh, to go over to Europe and live for about a year or so and, and gain some of that influence, especially having traveled it to some extent uh, now. You know, I, I would, I'd, I'd like to live there a while and pick up on some of that influence. What's the thing you miss the most when you're away? Well, of course, I'm a family man, you know, and I got two beautiful kids and, and a lovely wife. And, uh, so that's the main thing I miss, and I've got a beautiful farm that I live on, and, you know, I'm kind of schizophrenic. I get out here and live a nightlife, but when I get home, I'm in bed by 9.30 and up by 6, and uh, watch the sun come up, and I hop on the old tractor and go uh, do a little bush hogging or something, and uh, it's a completely different life when I get home. It's great that you have both. We out of tape? Perfect. Okay. Great. Uh, came out with his country records. That's that's when I got hip to it. And I uh, sort of saw country music in a different light. And then later, when I heard Floyd Kramer for the first time, uh, I was really impressed with him. And, and uh, he, was, he was one of the main influences on me. It was just a second ago you were... Uh... You were singing some Johnny Cash for us. Is Johnny uh, <laughs> you a fan of his? Oh, yeah. Uh, my sister used to be an usher at the Johnny Cash show. If you remember back in the 70s, early 70s, he had a television show. And uh, she used to get me in free. I went to a couple of shows, and I really enjoyed that. But, uh, Kenny Aronson is really the Johnny Cash authority in this band. I have to pass the hat to him. Eventually, the guitar players in town started uh, out, uh, outdoing me, so I had had a little experience with a piano. My mother played piano, and I used to imitate her, and I, I sort of got an ear for it, so I switched over to keyboards, and man, we used to play every fraternity on uh, on the fraternity row there in Tuscaloosa, you know, and that, that, that was uh, big money and lots of fun, you know, all the beer you could drink. I was playing at its very best. Yes, what, indeed. Um, what, what was the name of your first band? The Misfits, <laughs> with a Z. <laughs> what kind of music did you guys play? 
Oh, we covered uh, pretty much everything I, I just said. The Beatles uh, and uh, lots of R&B, though. We, we were heavily influenced. You know, Temptations, Four Times. Chuck, where'd you grow up? I grew up in the metropolis of Tuscaloosa, Alabama. And what kind of music did you listen to when you were growing up? Lots of rhythm and blues. Uh, Otis Redding, Wilson Pickett, uh, Rita Franklin. But then, of course, I was around when the British, uh, the first wave of the British invasion happened, and so I was definitely influenced by the Beatles and the Rolling Stones and uh, a few of those guys, zombies, you know, that kind of thing. We used to play fraternity parties. You see, that was uh, that was how I got into music. I started out playing guitar. <clears throat> When I was about 13, we used to play YMCA parties on Friday nights, and uh, uh, that was real big back then. Of course, Muscle Shoals uh, was in full swing back in those days, and there was a lot of records being done up there, and rhythm and blues was a heavy, heavy influence in the South in, in those days. That was, I'm talking like 64, 65. Being from the South, and we were talking about your influences, I noticed you didn't mention any sort of a country influence. Did it have none on you at that point? Well, it was there, but I grew up in suburbia and went to, uh, you know, a high school in the middle of town and everything. It wasn't like I was in a real rural situation. So as I was growing up, the kind of music that was around me was uh, mostly what was on the contemporary radio stations and, and not, not the country stations. It wasn't until later that I began to appreciate it, really, when Ray Charles came yeah, when you talk about John. Yes, he just, he just uh, gave us an earful about John <laughs> just a little while ago. So, let's see, you're 13 years old or so, you're in a band called The Misfits. What well, after that? Well, we had our own little TV show, The Misfits. We had, as I mentioned, the uh, YMCA on Friday night. We had a show called Tuscaloosa Bandstand, fashioned after American Bandstand on Saturday mornings. And you know, it was the same kind of thing. We'd have all the, the kids from school come and, and dance, and uh, we'd do the music. And they used to put these funny little signs in front of the guys in the band, you know, like one of the guitar players' name was Ronnie. They'd put gut plucking Ronnie up there. <laughs> they had all these silly little things. But it was, you know, we thought we were hot stuff back then. Hey, man, I had our own TV show, had the YMCA locked in on Friday.